Hey everybody, welcome and thank you, Seth of Hindo. Uh, excuse me, Hindo Henderson on YouTube Network is with us, and also Zenny Sixty Two Man, who which I own stock to. Uh, behind schedule, folks, I'll get there. That's why I'm putting it on air, just to basically kick myself in the tail and say, "Get your blankety blank together, Mr. Abraham." There. All right. How's your day, Seth? We're uh, we're doing pretty good. It's been a uh... It's been a, a rough couple couple weeks back at school, just trying to get acclimated to the new schedule and the the mostly the work schedule outside stuff, and haven't as much time to uh, make some content yet. But I'm just trying to get ahead on some of the schoolwork, and then we'll get back to making some videos here on the on a regular basis. School's first, man. Hey, what's your major, by the way? Uh, my major is journalism, so I'm doing. I'm the editor in chief at uh, at my school right now. It's a, a Casamina Server College in Elk Grove. For yeah. our publications called The Connection, and it's my second year or my second semester uh, being the editor in chief and uh, just really trying to handle t- teaching new people things and uh, and uh, trying to recruit people. <laughs> it's a you know, it can be a handful, and then on top of that, just make sure I get all my schoolwork done and then still have time for family stuff. It's there's there's not enough hours in the day, I'll tell you that. <laughs> nice, hey, so let's talk Raiders because. Look, folks, I mean, let's just get this out of the way. And I'll put up the uh, share the screen for the the little uh, image that I made to announce the news. And uh, voila, there he is. Uh, Tom Telesco is the Raiders' new general manager. But the question that I have is, will this Tom Telesco bring Khalil Mack back in? The reason why I say this Tom Telesco is because if you actually Google Tom Telesco, folks, there are all kinds of different Tom Telescos. There's, yes, there are. You notice that? Tom Telesco has one of the most, must be, one of the most common name combinations in the world. I have never seen anything like this. This guy can hide out anywhere in the United States of the world, and I guarantee you they wouldn't find him. You know what I mean? I mean, look at the face. It's normal, you know. He's, you know, it doesn't matter whether he's black because there's a lot of black guys that could hide and be Tom Telesco today anywhere in the world. They might even wind up working for the CIA. You never know. Yeah, I mean, he's a uh, he's definitely got a got a face you can forget. I'll I'll say that <laughs> Charlie Brown. But <laughs> so who this Tom Telesco? The question is, having said all that, let's personalize him. He was born. December 12th, 1972, which means he is 10 years younger than me, born August 4th, 1962. He is an American football executive, according to Wikipedia, who was the general manager for the Los Angeles Chargers and now is the general manager for the Las Vegas Raiders. And he was with the Chargers for 10 years, which brings in a lot of the of some good, uh, some bad, and a lot of ugly, especially, you know, considering the game that he was presided over before he got fired. Ooh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, he, he was he was a part of uh, that Raiders franchise history, too. Ah, and we will have you part of that. We'll have you fill in in all those blanks. <laughs> College football and education grew up in Hamburg, New York, attended St. Francis High School, graduated in 1991. Played wide receiver at John Carroll University in Ohio. Started the football team in the Ohio Athletic Conference. Won that championship with the school. Got a BA in business management in 1995. Worked a college summer intern with the Buffalo Bills. Then in 95, was a scouting assistant for the Panthers. And then became an area scout in 97. Then jumped to the Colts from 98 to 2000. Pro Scout from 2001 to 2003, then Director of Pro Scouting from 2004 to 2005, and then Director of Blair Personnel after that. And he was with the Colts during the Dungy era and the Peyton Manning era from 1998 to 2012 when the Colts went 154 wins, 86 losses, and presided over some of the most historic games of our time, including one that I attended, the 2006 Super Bowl. Now... He jumped to the Raiders January 19th of 2013. 
thanks to Dean Spanos, who I met when I was trying to bring the Super Bowl to Oakland in 1999, my first NFL party. And they chose him as the general manager after firing the legendary A.J. Smith. And from there, he had a kind of a lukewarm tenure, I would say, basically hallmarked by the fact that they moved. <laughs> and eventually he was fired December 15th of last year after the Chargers got hammered by the Raiders 63-21 to in among the most hilariously joyful games I've ever seen in my entire life as a Raider fan. Personal life, he's married to Lara. They have three children. Congratulations to him. And he's a friend of David Caldwell, who the famous man who was offensive coordinator of the the uh, Baltimore Ravens and guided that Joe Flacco led team to their Super Bowl win in 2013. And um, he played for the Blue Streaks football team. He was also teammates with Chris Pollan and Greg Roman. The rest of that is kind of like a blah, 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 blah. Not much about his accomplishments, except that he put a good squad on the field based account ignores certain things. Like, for example, Seth, Joey Bosa. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I think uh, a lot of people give him flack for his free agency, um, for his free agency pickups that haven't been um, as notable, but the most notable free agency pickup of, uh, pickup of all, well, I guess kind of more of a trade, uh, was the uh, Khalil Mack. Him, yep. him just being able to, to pick up Khalil Mack from the Bears was uh, that 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 helped them out immensely because Joey Bosa wasn't able to get it done by himself. He he himself isn't a game wrecker. He needs he needs a full defensive line. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you think the who's now the GM of the Raiders will bring him back home? Well, or should he? Um, I think he should. I think it'd be like I was just saying in the comments to Neil Nez here. Shout out to Neil. Um, I was just saying I think the uh, it, it'd be really cool to pair uh, Mad Max up with uh, Khalil Mack and and really really kind of bring this Raiders defense uh, up to another uh, to like a whole new level. But Khalil Mack has pretty much said that he he does have some people in the Raiders front office that he is beefing with and that he would not be excited to work with again. And um, you know maybe that could be in the way, but. Maybe bringing Telesco over wow. was kind of part of that part of that deal. So when he when did he say that? Because the Raiders front office underwent a lot of change. They didn't have the team's first black female president, or the NFL's for that matter. When did he say that? Um, I couldn't tell you right now. I mean, I could look it up. Was it? I mean, just let's kind of ballpark it. Was it last year or the year before that? Um, the year before that? I want to say last year. Okay. Because my memory doesn't go back too far. And what did Khalil Max say specifically? Let's look that up. No, it had to, I think it was this season. Oh, I mean, no, you know what? Maybe it was during the Pro Bowl. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And because um, someone had asked him, hey, are you, you, ever, you ever thinking about. Uh, Going going back with the Raiders, he, and he had said that there's just a few more, there's just a few people in the front office that he doesn't mess with. See, so hey, shout out to two Red Rings. He said Max said those people are no longer with the Raiders. Yeah, hmm. that's what I'm getting at. I think one of those people might have been Mark Bedane. Okay, ah. if it wasn't Mark Bedane, then Dan Fentrelli. You know, because uh, uh, Dan and Mark were sort of two peas in a pod for a while, and I know that because I was. At the 19, excuse me, 19, ugh, Zinni, 2019 Raiders sponsor party at CES Las Vegas, introducing uh, the then new Allegiant Stadium, which wasn't even open. And, right. you know, Ventrelli and I were talking with Elliot McCabe, who represents Bank of America and is the stadium banker of the NFL. And just across the way, about eight feet, was Mark Bedane over there. Okay. Uh, and then Mark Davis was up on the, floor uh high rise there with jerry jones and howie howie you want to see all this folks actually just type uh raiders sponsor party zenny 62 ces and you'll see the six minute video that i made thank you to my 
buddy Bruce Bateman who had brought, who invited me along because he is a tech investor and needed somebody to go in. He goes, ah, I'll take Zinni. So hey, that's how I wound up in there. To Mark Davis' surprise, was look kind of looking up, kind of like, what the blank is he doing here? But Mark was nice about it. <laughs> yeah, that was we're cool now. That was well, that was funny to me. It was funny, you know. Um, at any rate, uh, it. I think the Raiders have changed substantially in, in their front office. There are a lot of people. There's a lot of turnover, a lot of it. Yeah. Just if if you know, but the turnover stuff aside, what makes him better? The champ Kelly. Well, to me, when I look at champ, champ has he has a decent amount of a decent amount of experience. But I thought about this exact same question when I was uh, sitting on the light rail home from school today, and I came up with one one simple comparison is what I will leave it to. Champ Kelly was a part of the decision that led to drafting Justin Fields. And Tom Telesco was part of the team that drafted Justin Herbert. And Justin Fields, I say, is like a fringe top 15 quarterback at best. And um, Justin Herbert's definitely inside the top 10. Okay. So was it fair to fire him if he got all this talent in and arguably Brandon Staley didn't know what to do with it? Or here's my take on it. If he got fired, general managers don't just make their draft picks and sit tight. They're constantly looking at the roster, constantly trying to figure out who to put on the practice squad, trying constantly trying to get them ready. So to me, he had to do something to not get the Chargers ready during the season, right? I think and this getting I have with Champ Kelly is what did Champ Kelly? It looked like Champ Kelly put the Raiders instead consider their injuries to play very well. So with all of that, I mean, you know, with all that, why fire him? You know, some, my point is, my question is how well d does Mark Davis and company understand what it is that they're really responsible for? And if they don't understand it, why let, why not let somebody else do it who does understand it rather than constantly make these firings? You know what I mean? Because you have a general manager that's sitting back and he's making sure that you've got top-notch players on your practice squad that can be elevated. Who can be swapped out with an injured player at a moment's notice without a beat, a loss of a beat. That's that's the real place where the general manager earns his or her stones. Okay? So and, and um and you are right, but I will say there's a caveat to that in which the general manager's responsibility is to yes scout the player and find the player that has the capabilities, has um, you know the metrics, has the has it uh, you know between the ears. But in when the in the beginning part of what you're saying for that player to be able to step on the field at any moment's notice when the player is when um, you know the starter in that position is hurt, that is on coaching. That requires coaching. Yeah. The 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 depth is not found through the draft. You can't, when you draft depth, it still has to be coached. You know right. what I mean? Right. And, it's developed. Right. And arguably, I think that's one of the things that um, Telesco has been able to uh, do successfully is find players that are coachable and that can develop. Because, I mean, if you look at the the roster since he's been there in 2013, they're, they're pretty solid. They're, those are some pretty solid guys. But so then it points to the coach. All right. But then it still begs the question why get rid of him? Except the possible answer is if you want a, a coach who is going to coach their players better, right? Let's say that's your primary objective, okay? But then there's a secondary reality that commonly, commonly, the general manager first selects the head coach. So you bring your GM first and let them set the tone. I'm not saying it, there are a lot of people who don't do it that way. They they should, but they don't. But that's the classic model. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Chargers, we're getting a reset. Okay, hey, yeah, we want to get rid of Staley, but you know what? We want to completely 
get somebody in here because we are looking at the horizon and we see all of these super talented coaches on the horizon, like possibly Bill Belichick, they didn't know at the time, possibly, you know, Pete Carroll, they didn't know at the time, but there were inklings that this could happen and it happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you have a lot of talent out there. Look, Ron Rivera. I mean, it's just a wash with super talented and experienced coaches. Eric Bieniemy looking to move up. Will he? We'll find out. All right. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So ultimately, you have this place where you're the kid in the candy store if you're the team owner, and you want to figure out who to bring in that's going to set the tone for your entire organization. And that always starts with a GM, unless you're going to go even higher and start with the president and then let this president hire the GM and blah, 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 right? But it's a pyramid. Right. So in the Chargers case and the Raiders case, we're getting a pyramid. And I think um, we're still using the pyramid concept, but the pyramid concept is an afterthought in terms of uh, how we're using it. The way it's constructed yeah. is from the ground up. We are building our foundation is Antonio Pierce. Right, right. And, and from there, Champ Kelly is still a part of the Raiders. He is still the assistant GM. And then now Tom Telesco, even though the GM role is technically up here, it's not part of the foundation. So that's where he that's where his role doesn't play um, as much. It, it doesn't have as much weight. But as, does it make, does that make it confusing then? Um, how do, how do they know that Telesco and Pierce are going to click? Well, that's the that's the reason that they hired him is because so they brought him in for a second interview, and it's reported that um, the the second interview had Antonio Pierce and Tom Telesco in the room. They mm -hmm. got to chat it up a little bit and discuss some plans and and what have you. And and the report was that their vibe was they were clicking. So yeah. okay. and and it was very shortly after I saw that report. I mean, I literally saw that report, refresh my page, and then um, I think it was Adam Schefter or Ian Rappaport that tweeted out the 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 Raiders are you know very close to signing Tom Telesco. It's you know it's moments away from happening. And uh, and and actually to to go to your point about the Chargers. Um, they're about to do the exact same thing because Ian Rappaport reported that they're within striking distance of a deal with Jim Harbaugh and they don't have a general manager yet. So they're going to be pulling the same, the same type of strings here. Mm -hmm. And I think the AFC West just got a whole, a uh, whole lot more interesting. And I oh. think, uh, I, I think, uh, it's going to be 2024 is going to be a really, really exciting year. I think it's going to be a year for the underdog. You know, if the De if the Detroit Lions for some reason don't win it, and we can talk about the Super Bowl stuff here uh, later because I've got some theories about that as well. But um, if, you know, if the Lions don't make it to the Super Bowl or whatnot, they'll they'll definitely be a team that um, you know off the start of the season people are talking about Super Bowl teams. Um, I personally thought that Harbaugh was going to go to the Commanders, but because uh, you know, especially after being in D.C. and and um, there was just chatter of him in the area. And then with Adam Peters being there, another, you know, former 49er, I thought maybe there could have been a, some overlap there, but uh, if he's coming to the chargers, man, we, the AFC West is going to be locked and loaded, but the commanders, as I was saying, could be, you know, whatever happens with them, they could be a team that's coming up. I just think there's, there's a lot of interesting movement, you know, with the eight head coaching, head coaching openings that we previously had uh, throughout the off season, slowly getting them filled up. We are in for a good one. Hey, so here's the thing. All right. What do you expect the Raiders to do in the draft? I know it's early, but, you know, they mm -hmm. got the 13th pick. I no. don't – okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, go ahead, Zenny. I was going to say, I was just – I don't think the Raiders are going to sit there. Absolutely the not. I don't think they're just going to sit there and wait for whatever just drops down to them. I think they're going to move around some. What say you? Um, oh, I didn't see this uh, comment down here. Shout out to the great deer 53. It looks like he's uh, coming in here from, uh, from my stream. Shout out to you, uh, man. I, I honestly think the Raiders will be, uh, the Raiders will, there is a situation where they could sit at 13 and I'll tell you how. If they try to trade up to the top three, because that's the only place that you're going to be able to get 
a top notch guy because it could very very easily be Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels in any very vari- variation of that order for mm-hmm. the first three players off the board. Period. So if the Raiders, you know, want any of those guys, what and- about Marvin Harris? What's that? What about Marvin Harrison Jr.? I think he goes four. I think he goes number four overall because mm-hmm. I think that there's gonna there are so there are at least um, I want to say there's at least four to five uh, teams ahead of the Raiders that need a quarterback. Mm-hmm. Now you have Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins, uh, Justin Fields, and um, let's see, I think Gardner, Gardner Minshew and Baker Mayfield. But a couple of those guys are probably going to at least uh, discuss deals. You know, maybe a, potentially a long-term contract with the teams that they were uh, just playing with. So the the that, that's what I'm talking about, about how the season's about to be so interesting because there's so much movement that is possible. I don't think uh, if the Raiders don't have what it takes to trade up to those top three, like let's say you know it comes to draft day and they try to trade up to one and, and they can't get there. So I say, okay, well, let's, let's go for two. And someone beats them out on two. Mm-hmm. And they try to get to three and someone beats them out on three and, and all three quarterbacks, you know, because in that situation, boom, you know, you got beat out on an offer. You got, so they all traded up. Now, it's said that uh, Tom Telesco never trades down, which means, <laughs> yeah. all right, he's going up. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, with those four seventh-round picks, I, I'd like to see how he's going to uh, get back into some of these earlier rounds to be able to get some more you know, high-caliber guys. But really, I think if he's unable to trade up and get that quarterback that he wants – we're going to go offensive tackle because he builds from the trenches. You know, he builds, he builds from the line of scrimmage out. So he works <laughs> offensive line, defensive line. Sorry to interrupt you, but it occurs to me that I think they would wait until they won't find out who their offensive coordinator is going to be. Because you know well, what, you know, they're going to work in the room. It will definitely, um, it will definitely matter who the OC is, but yeah. Cause if it's King, for example, right? If it even if it's Kingsbury, though, that's he's still going to need an offensive line because his his style, um, his style of offense is is so reliant on getting down the field. The quarterback needs a little bit of time. Well, the reason why I emphasize that is because, and it goes to a question, an obsession I had with what's called what's called vertical set blocking. Mm-hmm. And vertical set blocking in the air raid, which, which I'm a fan. And have been for it since Mouse, Mouse Davis created it, well, arguably. Uh, although others would say that I was running shoot. Sorry, I meant I meant uh, Hal Mummy and um, Tony Franklin, who's been on my show twice. I'd uh, love to get Mr. Mummy and uh, that that group over there, including Sonny Dykes. Uh, of which, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. But at any rate, um, my point is vertical set blocking is stand up. In fact, you can see a conversation I had with Luke Jokel about this when he was being drafted. You stand up from the start. You even run block in this position, and it's advanced. But my point is Cliff has a different view. He doesn't really like that standard vertical set, but he looks for people who can block from that anchor position. Right. Okay. Yeah. So my point is that it, you know, these little new these little things, all right, these little trinkets of of, of thought add up to what offensive coordinator brings to the table when you're talking about a draft. And now let's say it's not him. Let's say it's um, the guy who's currently the quarterback's coach for the Bengals. I, I don't think he's been hired yet. He's kind of sniffing around, right? Yeah. Um, man, what's his name? Uh, Dan with a oh, P. Pe- yeah. Pe- Petrol. Yeah. Yeah, so not, not quite not quite petrol like English, but close. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's like P E T R A L, patrol. Right, patrol. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's where we should get our binoculars kind of trained because I guarantee you the minute they see him in, everything's going to fall into place in terms of what they want to do in the draft. Uh, which gets to my question, my question to you. What do you think the Raider is wrong? Or was wrong with the Raiders' offense last year? Um, I think it was the the 
the thing we're talking about right now, the offensive line. Um, mm-hmm. And as good as you know, PFF may have graded them and and whatnot. That they, it's it's kind of like the same thing for the defensive line. It's Colton Miller, and then there's everybody else. Andre James has done, you know, he's been okay. He's you know, he he did a lot better this year than I expected him to. Uh, Dylan Parham kind of let me down. I thought his um, his you know spot at left guard right there was uh, was the weak spot. That's where that's where Aiden O'Connell was getting attacked up through the middle. Mm-hmm. Was that that was all Andre James and, and Dylan Parham, and so I think there was some confusion there. And then um, if if you if you look at our uh, free agency, almost all of the offensive line is gone. So that's that's another reason why no matter what, if you um, the Raiders' first pick is either going to be a quarterback in the top three, or um, or an offensive lineman at. 13 or if they can trade up to uh, like seven, eight or nine to get Joe alt, Mm -hmm. that guy is a generational offensive lineman, but he, the only thing is he's a left tackle. So um, Colton Miller would either have to get moved around or this kid would have to learn something new. Either way, they're not be able to, they're not going to be able to both play left tackle. So um, might be able to kick him inside and and let uh, Parham play center. Like he was uh, like originally drafted to. So, um, and then I think, Thayer Mumford and then and then we draft another right guard you know probably we're going to have to trade up back into the second round to to get another guard because I think the uh picking picking an offensive lineman with pick 13 or seven eight or nine or something like that uh Telesco it's it's maybe maybe not official but I've, I've just seen a lot of chatter about Telesco possibly trading up to get uh trading back up into the second round to get Bo Nix. But see, here's my thing. That's my thing. And my question is what kind of offense do they want to run? Because you're talking about, you know, different um, linemen and I'm thinking, okay, do we want somebody that can execute a full block? A full block is where you have the center and the guard and the the guard goes first here. The center lets him go because the center's got to snap the ball anyway. And then Mm -hmm. comes around here. Yeah. Quick center can execute that. If you're slow, you're dealing with a linebacker that's going to blitz. Guess what? Kabuja, right? Okay. Yeah. So, or do you want somebody? And because you plan not to do that, and you're just simply going to zone block and road grade and like that sort of thing, right? That dictates who you who you want. Do you want somebody that is 330 pounds that can move well like that, a light 300 pounds, or do you want somebody who's a mid 300 pounds and you don't care how mobile he is because you're not going to ask him to pull right mm-hmm. that's most of the questions i have because that's going to dictate who they go after or should dictate who they go after in the draft and free agency rather than you know picking somebody because some guy you know in a room like mine says oh pick this dude or this dude or this dude because they are more specific about their wants right right so that's what i'm getting at i want to know what their wants are and what they're what they're going to do you know what they're going to do because my because when I hear you say, you know, our right guard had a problem, and everything else. You know what I think about? I think about the fact that we didn't call as many play action passes as we should have. I think about the fact that we didn't call as many bootlegs as we should have. I think about the fact that we didn't use multiple form- formations. In other words, no pre shifting, right? Yeah. So we didn't give the pre- we didn't get defense anything to, th- to anything to think about. It's kind of like oh, they there, and we know it was worse under McDaniel's. Oh yeah. my God, he gave me a heart attack. So my point is, maybe we should just throw out the entire year last year and just call it a wash and start all over again. Because, you know, th- with what we've got. Because McDaniels, I made a video about this, man. He drove me nuts. With, oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I may, I'll, I'll, if, I, if you'd indulge me calling up this video, because this his practices literally sent me to the moon. I mean, just, you, you know, to the moon, Alice, but, you know, Alice sent me to the moon. We've been, Alice is sending Zinni to the moon. <laughs> but, uh, oh, it hurt so bad to watch this. Oh, it was just literally like, are you kidding me, man? And um, let's see here. Mick Daniels. Zinni 62. Uh, and then. Fire, bad money. Here it is. Uh, what I like about where I've seen- Oh, yeah. At first, I like that he played great attention to formation spacing. But there was something else I didn't like. I didn't like 
um, pass block. McDaniel Zinni 62 pass. Um, yes, here it is. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This was what I'm, this is this is the signature example of what I didn't like about McDaniel's that 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 filtered into offensive line and also just just play design. Okay, um, just just play design. It was just uh, just it made me sick. All right, it made me sick. Um, uh, here, here. All right, let me go up here. Uh, there it is, right here. Oh, uh, Zenny, what'd you do? Oh, pass. Come on, Zenny, get your act together. Okay, there it is. There that is. And, uh, oh, this is it, right here. Did you know nearly half? All right, let me put that there and then stop the screen, go present, share the screen. Go down here. This was remember Alex Le Leatherwood and all that. Oh yeah, they are picking on my boy, man. Because I thought he was good. He watched. Half of Americans may have blood pressure concerns. With I hate to break it to you, Zenny. I'm sorry, he wasn't. I disagree. Hey everybody, Here's why. this preseason there's been a lot of criticism regarding one player, <laughs> Alex Leatherwood. Alex Leatherwood, the Oakland Raiders I offensive you, sir. No, I didn't say offensive tackle, offensive guard, because he's played both in a short time with silver and black. Look, I wasn't one who was in favor of Alex being drafted in the first round, but he was. And Mike Mayock apparently believed that his versatility, being able to play either guard or tackle, would benefit the Raiders um, and for the most part let me get to the point because that's too long that's been true although not let me start here let me go here demonstrate but let's is also let's not forget that in the NFL you're going up against the best of the best and the coaches have to be mindful of putting you in the right position to get the best out of you to go up against the best and to this realize my, the best performance. That was my issue. Here's the example. So the, to the extent that Alex Leatherwood is not performing well, it really is the coaching staff's fault. That's all I was saying. And let me explain what I mean. I can take on a number of plays that show what I'm about to demonstrate, but let's right go here. This is from the Patriots game. And I'm actually going to start with a play that doesn't feature Leatherwood's making a mistake. I'm going to start with a play that shows the basic problem that is impacting how Leatherwood performs. It's this pass blocking. The Raiders are asked to retreat. Raiders offensive asked their offensive linemen to retreat too quickly and go too much ground. And so what happens is that they get pushed back. Oh, go uh, go full screen with this, any. Oh, I'm, I am. I'm not give touching up a sack. No, I mean uh, full screen on YouTube. Position where they wound up. I did. It's full screen. Passer. Oh, full screen on YouTube. Okay. But see, if I go full degree, screen, then we'll let's just try something. If I go, if I go full screen, I won't be able to see anything else. Third quarter. Full, full, remaining they'll fill up my screen. It's the Patriots this evening. Oh, well, it's just us talking. All right, right there. Stop it. Okay. Oh, I see what you're doing. At. Okay, let me try that that way. Look at what they're doing. They're giving up a lot of ground. Like that, they're right? They're not using, okay. oh. with the exception of 78. Is that right? Oh, it just went black. Oh, uh, see, I thought but it was going to happen. Hold on. As a whole, yeah, see, I thought Raiders it was gonna players happen. are not push pass blocking. Okay, so now we... Which is um, a style that I favor that was popularized by... Let me freeze that. That's a little quirk regarding StreamYard. All right, hold on a second. Let me bring that oh, that's back. That's interesting. Yeah, well, hey, you know, live and learn, right? Uh, hey, yeah, I thought it was worth a shot, you know what I mean? Yeah, it is. Hold on a second. Okay, share screen. Yeah, but what I was saying is that uh, they have, they, the Raiders had their linemen under McDaniels retreating too much. They're giving up too much ground. They were not fight blocking. Boom, boom, boom. You know, like uh, the Patriots are good at doing that, among others. Right. The Steelers do it, among others. Dan Rakatovich, when he was 
the offensive line. In fact, that's who I'm referring to when he was the offensive line coach during the days of the Steel Curtain and Bradshaw and Swan. And coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers during the 70s. <clears throat> and so what happens is that because the Raiders offensive line is not doing that as a unit, you only have two people doing it. All right. One of them actually is the tight end after he releases. So he doesn't really count. What happens is that because they're not using their arms to keep the defense away from them and pushing them back as they try to rush the passer, they get past the offensive linemen really quick at points and are able to rush in like that. Yep. And this is the result. Boom. Okay. So Garbers is fleet footed enough to get out of it or almost get out of it. And at times he doesn't and gets stopped and get stopped. So this problem of how the line is asked to block works against Leatherwood because he is the most greatly scrutinized player on the organization and has been in that position and has been since he came in because people thought he was drafted higher than he should have been taken. Not his fault. Not his fault. He's, now let's look at what he stop did there, in but college. It gets to my point, Seth, contrast, and I'll just talk about it. Talk, talk it from here. Right. But I think you see my point. My point is a lot of his problem was, first of all, being he was put out of position. They should have just left him at guard and he should have made him a run, a run blocker, which is what he was at Alabama, mm-hmm. and, and left it that, and left it at that. And stopped putting him at tackle and you know putting him basically out of position. But then also asking, hey, look, what are we doing in terms of our play calls and design that's causing him to have a problem? He ain't just coming up with this. He, he's a kid out of college. This is his first job out of college. He's trying to make his bosses happy by doing what they ask him to do. So ultimately, whose fault is it? It's theirs. But what I don't like about McDaniels or how he does things is he doesn't take blame for blank. Okay? He's always pointing the finger, always somebody else. You cannot be a schematic adjuster that way. You have to say, first of all, since we drew the play, since we designed it, since we timed it out or didn't time it out but should have, it's our fault, and we put that young man in that position. Now, because then the other question is this, all right? I mean, it's, it's stupid things that are done, Seth. Like, for example, you ever wonder why a team would actually fake a dive before throwing a bubble screen when, and only to see a lineman or a linebacker come in and almost pick off the ball, right? So why fake it? I mean, they're not reacting to the fake anyway. And if you think about it from the perspective of what the middle linebacker is going to see, all he's going to see is the, that the running back is coming toward the quarterback and make the assumption there would be a handoff. So let him go with the action rather than asking the quarterback to actually fake it, right? Yeah. That way the quarterback saves time and throws it. These are little things that make an efficient play design. But if you don't do them and you you get what we see. And the reason why I'm so adamant about this is because and I think you'll, you'll agree when I say this, the people on the other side of the ball are now officially superhuman. Yeah. Right? Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are. Right. And so here we are. We're, we're, we're drawing up plays that somebody could draw up in the 60s with the same spacing. And I'm thinking, you know, why? <laughs> right? That's all I'm saying. I mean, look, you and I could be GMs. John, I mean, John yeah. told Bruce Allen, at the 2004 Lee Steinberg Super Bowl party, pointing to me as Bruce is going by and he goes, Bruce, don't you think Zinni would make a great GM? I froze. You know? Apparently I was doing something right. Didn't make it happen. But my point is, it's observation and analysis and putting things together. And there are a number of people watching this now that can make great analysts with the, the league on any level. It's right. just a lot of confidence. Yeah, that's true. And then, uh, 
Yeah, no, no, I'll just leave it at that. You got it. Yeah, you know, and so my point is, now that we solved the world's problems, <laughs> okay, I'm asking you as the team owner and me as the general manager, because this is where I think the problem comes from. What kind of offense do you think Mark Davis wants to see? He's probably telling them he wants. I think Mark Davis is telling whoever he's with, whoever is helping him along this hiring process, that I want to look as good, if not better, than the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, We have the nicest stadium in all of football, in the best city. You know, it's, you know, we named it Win City. This, you know, we... We are the dynasty. You know, I, I think Mark Davis wants the Raiders to be the focus of the NFL because they've been so lackluster for so long. And, you know, Mark, when you see old videos of the Raiders, Mark's there on the sideline. Mark's been there the whole time. Mark knows. Yeah. Mark knows the Raiders. Yeah. Mark's not. Mark's not dumb. Nope. So I, I think he wants to see a really flashy offense he wants to see a lot of points on the board i think he wants to see he wants to see a lot of lopsided games in the raiders favor he wants a lot of blowouts he wants a shutdown defense with a lights out offense and he, he, he just wants to be unstoppable and i think that's why he is so hell-bent on having so many minds in the room that have experience, you know, like champ Kelly has been around, you know, he's been with the Broncos and he's and the bears and now with the Raiders and then Tom Telesco, he's, you know, he's had his fair share of experience. And then Antonio Pierce, you know, he's, he's got a different kind of experience. He's got knowledge and, you know, he's got that player experience, but um, like, I'm sorry, whether if you're coaching, you know, high school and then you move up to college that fast and, and now you're a linebackers coach in the NFL and, and and gee, what was John Madden? John Madden was a linebackers coach for I think only two years before getting the head coaching job of the lot of the uh, then Oakland Raiders, and and then you know he went on to win uh, I think two two Super Bowls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I predicted in um in a live stream after Antonio Pierce got hired that give him three years completely you know three full years starting now the raiders will be competing in the super bowl i won't say that we'll win it within those three years but i'll say that we will be competing in the super bowl <laughs> at <laughs> least at the afc divisional game <laughs> or sorry conference game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the what, what do you think the difference maker will be that causes that outcome the difference is going to be whether or not we can trade up to one of those top three spots I think is going to be the largest catalyst in um, in getting the Raiders there because if you have to if, if we go through like I said earlier and, and you know you swing and miss on all first on the first three overall picks, well now now you're kind of now you're scrambling because you know there, it's less likely that Russell Wilson's still available. It's less likely that Justin Fields is still available or any of these other. Uh, you know, free agent market quarterbacks, mm -hmm. and and then you're stuck with, you know, Tyler Huntley, Tyrod Taylor, uh, who else is out there? Joe Milton, mm -hmm. uh, James Winston. Yeah, yeah, you know that that's the kind of stuff you're looking at. So well, I, think, well, I think I think James is an elite quarterback, though. So. James can be good, and he's somewhat good in the locker room. But the the controversial, oh, he's, the he's the best in the locker room out here, man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, he's definitely a locker room guy. But the uh, man, that last thing I think we were talking about it last time, going against Dennis for that for that fake. I, yeah, but here's the thing: I loved it. Yeah, and you know, it was it was great to see. But at the same time, it would have been greater if Dennis called it that way. Mm, no, not really. Here's why, and I'm glad you brought that up because we can talk about that in a second in this context. Uh, I go back to when quarterbacks called their plays. Uh, most notably, Ken Stabler, uh, Burt Jones, um, a number of teams, the majority of teams are quarterbacks called the plays. Quarterbacks not calling the play, like Roger Staubach and Dallas Cowboys, was still considered new. 
and but it was tied to an overarching organizational strategy uh, that had to do with computerized scouting, computerized game planning, which spit out the kind of play that was going to be considered to be called, and therefore Coach Landry on that basis would send in those plays, right? The Cowboys are way ahead of their time. Now, where are we today, right? Okay. Um, it's vastly different. And the idea, be it Bill Walsh or Tom Landry, who popularized it, and Bill Walsh, who really took it to another world level with scripting, mm -hmm. all right, is that we're not, we as coaches on the sideline, are not dealing with this maelstrom of activity uh, and these superhuman, the fast people that you have to deal with. And we have the data and the analysis and uh, the telemetry now to determine what play may work the best under what situation. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. But then there's this little thing called the teammate. Because you can have all these plans and all these planning. You put all these equations on the board and all this stuff. And you can figure that little thing that says just add water. Yep. Or in this case, just add emotion. Like how a person feels about somebody, they're getting pissed off with somebody and all the other stuff, okay? So when you get to that little bitty point, which seems to be little, what you find is you have a teammate over there that's getting to the end of the season, who's beat up and tired, who is the breadwinner not just for his family, but for his extended family and relatives that might add up to something like 30 strong. Or if you are someone like Vince Young, when he was drafted by the Titans, and I was there, and this is a video here at Zenny 62, he brought 100 family members to the draft at once. I have oh, never no. seen that many people in the basement of Radio City Music Hall in the Grand Lounge in my entire life. <laughs> okay? Okay? And then it takes on a whole new meaning. So then you've got a situation where your team intercepts the ball, brings it down to the one, and all of a sudden you got a guy over here who would get a million dollars if he scored a touchdown, but he never scored a touchdown. Gets real, don't it? Yeah. Right. And then you have a loud mouth who I like, who I've met, Shannon Sharp. So I'm not saying that to be personal. I'm saying that because, in my opinion, that's what he was being, and he knew it. He, he said the things about Jameis I thought were not fair. Because this man was the star of a third and six in the 1988 AFC Championship the game that I saw, where he caught the ball. But what I didn't know, it came out later, was the play was completely improvised by guess who? John Elway. Mm -hmm. After, after Mr. Sharp brought in a play that he told Elway they'd never practiced. Did he go against his quarterback? You see? See, my contention is that and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you two answers. One is the popular one. The other one is a pre the one nobody wants to hear, including me, but it has to be said. The first one is this. He forgot what it means to be a teammate. He forgot what it means to be in that huddle. And the quarterback is the person. But for the people who play with Jameis, they didn't forget. And it was one play. Yeah, one play. I mean, they were getting blown out. You know, I'm not trying to like take that situation out of uh, proportion here, but yeah, well, just, I didn't watch that part of it though. Because just you, in in relation to what you just said, right? If uh, my only problem with your comparison, uh, you know, with the Shannon Sharp example is John Elway is no way in hell. James, like, sorry, James Winston is no way in hell. John Elway. Yes, James, he is. James Winston has not. Yes, he is. You want to know why I say is? Because it's fun to disagree, okay? You have to remember, I'm old. You can disagree with me. Oh, I will. <laughs> I believe it. I, just because I'm young, I'm not afraid. Oh, man. <laughs> I can respect you, but I will disagree. Oh, man. 
He just did it twice. <laughs> that's all right. I'm getting used to this sort of thing. I don't have kids. See, that's the unfortunate. You're going to be my kid. Fine. All right, son. <laughs> all right. Here's my point. Um, with respect, deliver. Okay, of course. But uh, Jameis Winston's national champion. And I first heard about him. I was in the shower Saturday, and someone referred to him as the chosen one. I had never heard anyone talk about a black quarterback in those terms in my life. I had to. I got out of the shower to find out who they were talking about. It was Jameis. That was 2011. All right. Yeah. Uh, the man went on to have a phenomenal season, completed 73% of his passes. Then the next year, people, everybody was on the Jameis, you know, mm-hmm. the Heisman guy, right? Oh, yeah. What do you get another one? Okay. And then, all right. So they've, Scouted him like nobody's business, but it also turned out there are things like people mad at him. They're mad at him for not going to Alabama. Hmm. He's from Bessemer. Okay, he was supposed to go to Alabama. Instead, I thought he was going to go to Stanford. I thought playing under David Shaw would have been great. Yeah. So did Jameis' father. It didn't happen. Jameis has always been big on being Southern. He chose Florida State. He didn't want to be under somebody's nose. He didn't want to be a boy at Alabama. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I understand that completely. Yeah. He didn't even have his, his NFL draft party. It wasn't in Chicago where I was waiting. I thought it was going to be there. No, no, no. It wasn't at his home in Bessemer. Okay. So my point is that for not – Towing a line, Jameis has been punished in a number of different ways. And then he was big man on campus, walked into pot bellies. There are women that quite literally populate Tallahassee, you know, in ways that are undescribable because they have a nickname. They're called cleat chasers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And one of those cleat chasers took a bead on him. Got drunk. By the time she had met him, and by the time she walked in the pot belly, she had already had four drinks. Was handed a shot by the manager, not by Jameis. Met Jameis and started dancing on the dance floor. She was with her friends, including Madonna Monica and two others. Jameis and two other players uh, that are playing in the NFL now, cornerback, just flew out of my mind, plays with the Eagles. Ronald Darby, uh, they're all going to go back to their place, invited them. Erica Kinsman texted Monica, said, hey, should I go with him? Monica said yes. She went. Now, according to the sworn testimony of Ronald Darby and Chris, whose name I just forgot, she was the aggressor, got drunk, told them to leave the room and almost physically threw them out of the room and proceeded to make her way with Jameis. Jameis took her back on his little scooter, which kind of sounds sort of LL Cool J in. (laughs) Okay, all right. Uh, And then later, she didn't, she forgot what happened, which is what happens when you get inebriated, you forget what happened. But then people, Monica poured a story into her head, like maybe he did this, which wasn't what happened. Yeah. She wound up changing her story eight times, including this other very salient fact, which leads to um, this video that's on Zenny 62 that uh, a certain person tried to get taken down. All right. Uh, whose name I'll reveal in a, a, a minute, okay? But I say this because all of this has shaped how Jameis has been treated, all right? And uh, it is... Let me open this and freeze it. Step right there and then go here. And you'll see in a second. At any rate, this young lady, Erica Kinsman, not only had sex with Jameis Winston... But eight hours before, also had sex with the man she'd been dating with since high school. That guy. Jamal Roberts. 
the man she denied the existence of, the man she said she never had a boyfriend. This guy was her boyfriend the entire time. Now, you know how I found this photograph, sir? How? Because from the, from the jump, I never believed the story. And I started really looking when her auntie, Patricia Cornwell, said that her niece doesn't date black boys. Who's that? That's her husband now. Oh, she doesn't yeah. just date him. She marries him. Not only that, guess who found their website in a search? <laughs> Me. Well, gee, that must not have been too hard. No. And then not only that, if you played the video, actually, it was hard. It was a stroke of luck, okay? Hey, everybody, if you're wondering. This is the website. That's been All right. And. 12th, 2013. Okay. We've got more pictures up the there, too. Include like this one. She okay? was dating him. And it goes on and on and on. They oh. had that taken down. The website? Yeah. They had it taken down the minute I put it up. And then get this, all right? Let's go back to the, where we were here, okay? All right, there. You get this. Let me uh, bring this back. And then get this, all right? Mr. Roberts calls himself contacting me out of the blue. I couldn't believe it. He said, you know who this is. I just got my medicine at the doctor's office. I'm sitting in the car. I'm looking at that. What? I checked the location. It checks from where he's supposed to live. Because I'd done research. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. To make a long story short, this dude asked me to take that down. He asked me to take the video down. You want to know why? And, and the website. You don't know why? Because he said he didn't want any more publicity. He was trying to get a job. And you know how hard it is for a black man. Yeah, I do. But why would you go around and make it hard for another black man? They had conspired to get $950,000 from Florida State in a fraud. Do you hear what I'm saying? Wow. Fraud. And everybody who's so rushed to blame something on a black guy bought it. Hook, line, and sinker, including the entire media except me. All right? And I'm not a journalist. That's why I don't call myself a journalist to this day. Because journalists lie. There was a time when journalists actually did their work and they did investigate. All I did was investigate. It wasn't hard if you focus on it. It was right there. But they didn't care. They would rather tar and feather Jameis and could con continue the myth that we put out about black men all the time. It was BS, man. BS, okay? Man. And people should be mad about it. I put this out there. I told everybody. Jameis' father, first of all, it turned out because I was making so much noise that I was finding, even before this, that Jameis' agent at the time and his dad and uh, his marketing people had knew I was as far back as 2016. Damn. Yeah. I found out at the least time at, at the uh, Berkeley Symposium Law Symposium at Bolt Hall School of Law. Lee Steinberg was there. All right. They happened to be there. I had no idea. I just kept digging after that. This thing popped up two years ago. All right. I copied everything. Everything. And then he sent me the text and I saved the text and then I published the text. <laughs> All right. Because he's going to come up and like say, well, you got to take this down. This is news. Then he tried to get YouTube to take the video down. YouTube took it down. I, I said back to them, say, hey, wait a minute. This is a news issue. Let me just explain why. You know what? They put it back up again and told him he lost. Yep. Okay? Yep, as, as okay. they should. But who would go to that effort if they didn't have something to hide? You got something right about that. Yeah. Which now explains why Jameis managed to get his number retired at Florida State. Because now, thanks to me, there's enough information out there to say, you know what? You guys have been screwing with him. And that Uber driver, hey, his ex-manager put Jameis in there drunk and told the Uber driver she was carrying a, a rich man. 
setting him up for, for slaughter. Yeah. Okay? This man has been tarred and feathered and treated like crap again and again and again, and he's nice. Okay? And, and just just back to him, I'm, I'm not knocking him for, for anything he's done or anything that's happened to him off the field. All my my assessment is purely off of his play on the field and uh just just look at this season for example and when i say that james winston is not john elway Derek carr was a huge letdown for this was a huge letdown for the saints for the most part mm -hmm. um, you know you had you had all of who day of who dat or you know who day whichever one it is i can't tell yeah. angles have like the same thing going on who day is um steelers Really? I'm, I thought it was the Bengals. Oh yeah, who day is the Bengals? You're right. Yeah, yeah. so it's who dat and who day, but which are, so who dat? I guess uh, <laughs> they were all screaming up in arms and and uh, basically said, you know, hey Raiders, you can have Derek Carr back. <laughs> and everybody was screaming for Jameis Winston to come out there, and then and and they were up by what twenty points, and and Jameis blew that twenty point lead. They lost that game. It was. It he was really disappointing. He didn't blow the, the twenty point lead. We, they had a, they were I, I, those games came out. We were behind the Saints. The this because I'm a James Winston fan and I like Derek too. Okay, the Saints were behind by twenty seven points. Jameis came in against the Vikings mm -hmm. and brought them back to within a touchdown of winning. All right. Mm -hmm. the, the mistake. Okay, he took. Here's my issue. Again, this goes back to, frankly speaking, black quarterbacks until now, things are changing, have never gotten a lot of chances, including Jameis. He got the one. But the, the Buccaneers drafted him not to be a ball control person. Brian Glazer, who I'm acquainted with, I should say no, basically. I just haven't talked to him for a long time. We were really good, tight for a while back there. But they wanted somebody who would score touchdowns. They didn't like the, ball, the, the Bill Walsh ball control. Mm-hmm. Here's the irony. That ball control done well can produce touchdowns. Bill Walsh produced that. He chose, he showed that. Okay. And, and so what happened is that they got Jameis to be the bomb thrower. All right. And they didn't, it wasn't ball control. And, and, and when they got Bruce Arians, and this is something that Todd Monken, when he was Jameis's offensive coordinator, uh, at, at Tampa was doing a lot of things, excuse me, was not doing a lot of things he would have done today. How do I know that? Because me being the Jameis Winston fan, I was hammering him about it on Twitter, sending him plays like rollouts and everything else. He goes, oh yeah, this is a good idea. I said, Vary his uh, launch point because you're getting him killed. All right. And your, your blocking is getting the man killed. All right. And the reason is Seth is because people are always telling him to throw deep. That calls for blocking. If you don't have that blocking, guess what? It don't work. And people have put him, stupidly put him in that. And the piece de resistance example was what Bruce Arians did with his risk it, no biscuit. An approach that Carson Palmer said took two years to learn for him because in his first year, he threw 22 interceptions. And he said on the record that Jameis would have a better, better second year because he needed time to learn the first year where they literally threw him into the offense. All right? If you have the offensive playbook, which I do, there's nothing about it that's timing. If you want timing, you specifically draw your depth to what you're asking the receivers to do. Arians does not do that. Okay? They set it up so that in practice they sort of work it out rather than writing it down on paper. If you're, you're, you're making a playbook for people, as I've done like with my Eagle offense, look, John Gruden asks, we'll kiss to wait for me at the 2018 NFL annual meeting to get my play. My plays work. I know what I'm doing. You sound that, if that sounds arrogant, I'm sorry. I know what I'm doing because I've done it since I was 16. When the Dallas Cowboys invited me to their office at 6116 North Central Expressway, and I wound up getting a chalk talk about the flex defense from now late Ernie Stautner, the defensive coordinator of the Dallas Cowboys. All right? So my point is timing is everything. But you can either run your football organization like his say the glorified PE, you know, class, and a lot of people do, or you can do it the scientific way that it affects the fact that it's a multi-billion dollar organization, which is what I prefer. 
a number of other people do too. So my point is getting back to Mr. Winston to kind of round this out and get back to your points is that there are people who drafted him like Doug Williams or other black quarterbacks to either be the bomb thrower or the runner. Look at what the Red Reds, the once called Redskins did to RG3 and Jay Gruden did to him. Oh, I saw you talking to Jay Gruden on Twitter earlier today, man. That was funny. But did you see the did you did you see the videos I put up there? Yeah. yeah including the one where I was at the, the I like Jay Gruden as a thinker, which is what disappoints me about how he treated him. He should just yeah. simply admit that he was trying to finish the job that Mike Shannon had started in getting RG3 injured so they could bring in Turk Cuz uh, Kirk Kirk Cousins. It was awful. And it was obvious to anybody who really cared to look. Black quarterbacks have been violated, but the sneaky thing to do is, well, you know, we'll kind of make it look like he can't do this because we know that at the end of the day, this person is going to do what we ask him to do and we can get him in trouble and we can get him out when we put in the person we really want. Those days are coming to an end, Seth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's what I'm talking about, about this year being uh, a lot more exciting. It just seems like things are... I got to make one point, sir. One point. Mm-hmm. Jameis had one glorious year. 14 touchdowns, three interceptions under Sean Payton. So ask yourself the magic question, my sir, my friend. Why is it that the Saints didn't simply replicate that the next year and start Jameis? Why did the why did why did it look like the Bucks put a bounty to get him injured? Because it did. Okay? There are a lot of people. Why is it that there are several social media companies that represent white wing interests that make Jameis Winston the focus of the arguments they create online, including one Russian oligarch that owned 32 Twitter channels and made him the focus? All right. Jameis deserves a time in the sun where you don't have people talking about how funny he is and all this other BS. That has nothing to do with football. And, a, and an offense where he is a game manager. Oh, sorry. One second. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. My bad. Sorry about that. Not at all. That's what I was saying. And so, that, and so I apologize for... No, I don't apologize for that because I've been after this for a long time. It, it's... It's racism. You know, it's just racism. It's not, no one's calling him a name anymore. It's like, well, let's make up this thing that happens to him and, and, and get him in trouble so that at the end of the day, we have talented white quarterbacks and we don't have this black quarterback that everybody's calling for that interrupts the idea that somebody white should be on top. And there are people who think that. I mean, yes, there are, there absolutely are. But I think, uh, you know, they're getting weeded out and whittled out and, the only reason, uh, you know, like uh, the only reason Lamar Jackson's not being talked about so highly is because he doesn't have an agent and right. he doesn't like to play by those, you know, league rules, essentially. And he just wants to kind of do his own thing and play football. But remember how, what was going on when he was coming out? Remember what Bill, Bill Polian said about him? I hit the ceiling. OK, Bill Polian is part of that old guard. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's just, uh, you know. It'll probably be another 10 years, but then, you know, pretty soon all these good old boys from the good old yeah, boys you club. Gotta, you know what? You got to you gotta push them out, man. You can't oh. just wait. I'm, sorry, I, I, I'm 62. I'm like, I don't have that time. time. <laughs> I hope I, I hope I have more time. Lord, no, I got my mom here. But I want them out now. Okay. Not later. Not like 10 years now. Because, you know, society has been damaged by this stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the bet the best quarterbacks in the NFL right now are about to be, uh, you know, C.J. Stroud, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, and then uh, you know, I'd say we're, we're kind of getting to that even keel part right now. And I mean, we are, we already know how the rest of the teams are looking. You know, yeah. It's like, when's the last time we we just now saw a white cornerback in in last year's draft? Yeah, Riley Moss. Right, right. So let's get to my question: Why not Jameis Winston as a free agent for the Raiders? Um, for me personally, I'm sure, like I said, great locker room guy and all that, but he's talked way too much shit about football, about his abilities. He's talked way too much shit and not been able to 
you know, he's talked to talk, but hasn't been able to get out there and walk the walk. And when uh, talk- so Derek, Derek Carr w- had a had a bad game and, and and they were they were losing, and then it's that video that Jameis Winston liked on social media of it was these two comedians pretending to be Jameis and Alvin Kamara sitting on the sidelines saying, "Man, I don't know why they don't just let me get out there. Why don't they just let me throw the ball?" Derek Derek doesn't even know what he's doing out there. Like it was basically just trying to like make fun, and Jameis Winston liked it. A couple of games later, he gets his chance to go out there and he didn't win the game. He had, he had multiple yeah, opportunities. Was, there yeah, that, that game was among others of the reasons that got Pete Cowell fired. But you have to remember something. Remember the question that I asked you? I said, why would Sean Payton put him in an offense that caused him to score 13, 14 touchdowns and three interceptions? And yet they didn't run the same thing the year before. You know what they did next year? They put him into an offense that would knowingly get him killed by asking him to throw deeper. Remember what I was talking about? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. But see, here's my point. They put him in there. They ask him to run it. If he says no, guess what? He has no job and no food for his family. All right? That's a hell of a position to put a man in. But that's what they did. No one except me asked the question, hey, how come you used to run the same thing you put him in last year? When, when Sean Payton was the head coach. And why did Sean Payton leave, which is written and ever clearly, you know, explored? There's something wrong there. Okay? There's something wrong there. And do you realize they put him in an offense in 2022 that got Jameis Winston nearly killed, just like they did RG3? So when you come and you say these things to me, it tells me that you're one of the people that has been targeted because of the outcome and the announcers making the same pronouncements again and again and again, the same message again and again and again to get out this overarching idea that, hey, we got to put down these black quarterbacks before they start taking over. And, James is, and they started with Jameis first, okay? I imagine, think my here's, take here's, my point, here's my point. Here's my point. Imagine that I will shut up. And imagine, I promise, imagine if they had put Jameis Winston in the same offense. I think they still wouldn't. I think Jameis may have done well, but the Saints wouldn't have because that 14 touchdowns, three interceptions, that's a great ratio, but 14 touchdowns is pretty, uh, it's kind of a low number. Not seven season. games. Oh, seven games? Yeah. He, see, he got, oh, you don't know the story at all, my my friend. Okay. I'm not, I'm not too, I mean, if I, I don't have no off the back of my hand. Monday Night Football was the seventh game. Jameis was a starter against his old team, the Bucks. He went, he ran, trying to get out of bounds. Devin White came over and deliberately course collar tackled him, tore his ACL. Up to that point, Jameis Winston was 14 touchdowns and three interceptions, one of the best passers in the league. And it was widely accepted, widely accepted that he was marching the Saints to a playoff berth. Okay, that's how good they became under him in that offense with its short passing. And Sean Payton deliberately said at the start of the league year that he was going to cause James to unlearn the bad habits he learned. It was a teaching project, which is how it should be all the time. And it worked. He proved it. He proved it. And the Bucs didn't like it because, as Bruce Arians slipped and said, he has no business going over to their team. He was with us. This from a man who supposedly was his fan when he was coming out of high school and the best quarterback in the country. Yeah, right. Give me a break. Tried to break his legs. You know, this mafioso stuff. Bounty stuff. You know? Okay? So my point is, again... You give Jameis Winston a chance in a ball control passing offense and not in some crazy offense where you're saying, well, just go out there and sling it as Pete Carmichael told him. Right? So he tells him that. And then what do you see? You see him singing it. So basically it's like he's playing to our expectations because the stupid offensive coordinator is telling him to do so. Yeah, (laughs) Pete Carmichael is not the... uh... 
he he's not the offensive genius but then again I, i'm never have never was and and never never have been never will be a fan of uh dennis allen so well my, here's my thing i'm not i don't hate i cover the league there's anybody i hate oh yeah i don't hate anybody i'm just not a not not the biggest fan i'll still do my job now, i don't say that to criticize what you're saying i hear i'm right there in your wheelhouse what i'm trying to say is this i'm trying to say that my issue with bruce allen Excuse me, Dennis Allen. Sorry, Bruce. Is that uh, although Bruce, you made a comment about me in the paper about my Super Bowl bid, so heck with you. But anyway, my whole point is um, Dennis Allen has a problem with attention to detail. That's yeah. the problem. Okay, he doesn't understand specifically how to line up his offensive game plans with respect to his players and talent, and say. Am I asking them am I, to do the right thing? And not only that, if they're not doing the course of a game, am I going to go down there and fix it on the sidelines and draw up a new play and everything else? You don't see Dennis doing that, but you'll see Bill Belichick doing it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's things like that. Yeah. You know, that's what that's the thing. I guess. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I think Jameis deserves an opportunity somewhere. It's just if you're asking me if he should be the Raiders quarterback, I'm going to have to say a hard pass. I think the Raiders have had enough volatility enough question marks enough you know hope kind of um i'm i'm really itching for for some of that some of that generational talent you know what i mean that that fresh prospect you know i need a fresh face just uh i disagree i think he'll do a fantastic job if you if you put him in a sane offense i want to see Jameis winston in a sane offense because he hasn't had the luxury of it. His father and I have talked about it. His agent and I have talked about it. All right. I want to see that because he is one of the best passers in the league. And I'm tired of this racism that has washed over him and tainted who he really is. It's got to, it's got to be destroyed. That's what I'm getting at. And, you know, everybody can have their opinion, but there are a lot of us, particularly those of us who look like me and you, who get affected by it. And we need to be cognizant of how it affects our society and how it washes all over us. And we even we don't even realize it, and we're just going along. All this has an impact on us and our future. But the more people who look like us who are given a chance, like a CJ Stroud, but look at how CJ was treated coming in, right? You get one person to be that person, and you get enough screaming mouth mouths like me. And eventually things change. They all add up. But they've got to change. we got to stop this. So I don't care if it's Jameis or or anybody else who's black, who we know can do the job. If you stop putting him in nutty situations, we have to avenge what happened to RG3. They almost killed him, man. Oh, yeah. They almost killed him. Almost killed him. I will just say. Who I'm going to get out here? My friend Warren Moon. He'll tell you. Man, I saw him at the on on some uh, coverage of the Lee Steinberg party. Yeah, yeah, he'll be there. Yeah, he's a great dude. I want to see if I can get him on uh, our show, so you know, we can all meet. Man, that's, uh, man, that'd be amazing. Oh, he's an amazing dude. You know, there's a, a history there that um, that we're custodians of. Uh, we have to. To honor that, we have to honor the people that come before us and the people that are with us now. And even in my case, my age, the persons that are younger who don't, you know, what I didn't grow up, Seth, and others out there, I didn't grow up with the internet where the internet was telling us as black folks we couldn't do certain things and suddenly communicating failure. I had 600 books and magazines, and I wanted to work for the Walt Disney Company and build Epcot. Okay. It's a different way of thinking because you know that's all I had. I had my imagination. There was nobody. To t- there was nobody to tell me no. Yeah. Now, people are telling you and me no every moment of every day. I think one thing that I I tried to adapt early on, or one thing that I told myself I would do is, I don't care if somebody tells me no. You know, it's like I don't need someone to not be there to not tell me no because if I want to do something or if i'm going to do something 
I don't care what some outside force comes and says, mm -hmm. says some, especially if it's just to say, if they're just saying something to me, that has absolutely no effect on what I'm going to do. I mean, if you're trying to talk some sense into me, like I'll, even if it's a bad idea, I'll probably most likely do it because I'm going to find out for myself. It's like, whether it's a bad idea or not, I want the experience. And that way I can know this is a bad idea. And I want to know what's bad about it and why it's bad for me. I see the luxury though, is what you're coming up in your twenties. When I was coming up, I didn't have the internet to have to keep out an outside noise. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Big difference. You know, I, I think, you know, if you, um, if you use the outside noise and participate in it, it becomes quiet. So what I mean by that is your voice is just as loud as all those other voices coming out at you. You know, every, every time somebody comments, it comments, you know, at you or, or whatever you, you have a voice back, you know, there's a reply button, yeah, you, you know, there's another send. There's, like there's a problem you, with us today. Mm -hmm. Because of the internet, you have family member after family member after family member after friend, friend, friend showing you memes that advance a certain idea about black folks. You have black people telling you how to be as a black person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I was growing up before the internet, the only way that would happen is you stepped outside the house. Yeah. See, now you don't even have to step out of the side of the house, it's in your house. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I could, I mean, I would, when I was seven, eight years, nine years old, I would go into my room, I would draw the whole Starship Enterprise, I mean in detail. I would draw car and engine detail parts and everything else. That was my world. That was my internet. Mm -hmm. You know, I read the Reedy Creek Improvement District legislation when I was eight. That's why I know when, when DeSantis thought he could dismantle all that stuff and you know do what he was doing, I thought he was nuts. Because what it told me was that we have a generation now that doesn't know how to think in detail because they have the internet. They don't realize the complexity of legislation. We right. don't have anything around you to give you the answer. You have to figure it out yourself and all that stuff and calculate it and hope you're right. It's a different ball game. Yeah. You know, different ball game. So now, and that's why I'm started this company and what we do is terms of reputation management, right? Um, because you have people who are harmed by it who look like us all the time. You have news organizations that make money off of putting out bad news after bad news after bad news about people who look like us. Mm -hmm. And nobody says, hey, isn't that a little weird? Of course it's weird. You know, and then you have people call themselves conservative who think that it's, you know, conservative tended to put out something of that somebody black is a certain way. That's not conservative. That's racist. Yeah. You know, true conservatives understand what the price mechanism means and calculations and a lot of that. When you start putting that on people, well, it becomes a different ball game because they realize, hey, they don't really get it at all. Oh, it's a wow. It's a lot more complex than I originally thought. Ding! All right. So my point is, you know, we have a beautiful society that allows a person to create a company of scale rapidly that's mm -hmm. the beauty of the whole doggone thing but also it creates a lot of chaos a lot of mess and a lot of mischaracterizations of people that shouldn't be right that's well cool. let me ask you this since uh kind of rounded back out to the raiders here yeah to me, we've never left <laughs> <laughs> kind of went down the yellow brick road a little bit there but do you think the uh, do you think the Raiders will uh, will draft or or uh, sign a sign a black quarterback and keep the the black theme going? Except now they have a white white GM. Not that it really matters or anything, but just the uh, the diversity and in, uh, inclusion yeah. and equality. Yeah, because there's Jane Daniels. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's a matter of diversity, inclusion, and equality anymore. Yeah, not necessarily. I was, I was kind of joking. I think it's a matter of. You have, you know, I credit hip hop. In 1995, hip hop integrated society and it never stopped. Man, that's a pretty good point. And hip hop is the music that took the place of the rock music that white parents didn't want their kids listening to. It sure did. Right? Okay. Now it's hip hop, which caused white women to want to date black men. 
because they were the bad boys. Mm -hmm. Only to discover that, hey, those, so a lot of those bad boys are actually good boys. Right? So now they have kids, and their kids are interracially dating, and their kids are grown. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of the first, first part of what you said. Yeah. So we're at that point where we're integrated enough for people to know better and be able to turn around and say to those who don't, hey, you ain't supposed to be doing that. And that will get you a quarterback who happens to be black, dark skin or light, it won't matter, like Mahomes or Jaden Daniels, who will get the job done. And his fans will be white kids who are blonde and blue eyed, who may have a black, you know, stepmother. Mm -hmm. right? That's where we are today. It's not so cut and dried anymore. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is. Great. So I think I think to answer your question, I'm going to take my, my I'm going to take it from another perspective and ask, answer. Ask you this question, rather. If Jaden Daniels falls to the Raiders, do you think they should take him? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But here's the thing. It wouldn't be a fall. It would only be a fall if they traded up to three. And yeah. uh, uh, it, like, let's say the best case scenario would be uh, Drake May goes off the board, number one. Marvin Harrison goes off the board, number two. And the Raiders can trade up and get Caleb Williams at number three. Mm -hmm. Or Jaden Daniels at number four. That would be uh, that, that would be an absolute best case scenario. Now, see, I'll tell you the guy that, that if I were at number eight when the Raiders were picking last year, I would have taken two dudes. I don't even have taken Jay, uh, Jalen Carter or Will, yeah. Will, or Will Will Levis. You would have taken him that high? I would have taken Will Levis that high, yeah. Really? Air raid quarterback. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had you know accuracy in the arm. Um, I, I think for me – That's the thing, though. Hmm? Talk about cocky. Yeah, I like for me it was like the locker room. Like I didn't think he could lead men. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you got to think about the age of your roster when you're when you're when you're going about stuff like that. Like um, that's why I think Jordan's a, Jordan Love is a great fit for Green Bay because they have such a great young team. And then uh, Jordan's taking his time. And another thing I want to mention is the the great quarterbacks that we're looking at, or the the best quarterbacks that are playing besides C.J. Stroud. You know they. They weren't first first year starters. Patrick Mahomes wasn't a first year starter. That's he, true. He played a couple games in his rookie year, but I That's feel true. like people forget he was drafted behind. Well, I mean, he he was drafted to play behind Alex Smith. Yeah, that is which, true. which which they were already a playoff team. They were contending already. So, and, and now you have now you have Jordan Love who sat behind Aaron Rodgers, and and he's taken his time. And he's molded molded quite well, and they've developed and, and into what they want him to be. So, I think the best thing is even if we get, I mean, if it's Caleb Williams, that that might be a different thing. He could he could totally be a CJ Stroud, come out here, boom, start, you know, be a first year starter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think the only first year starters would be Caleb Williams and Drake May. I don't think the other quarterbacks could be first year guys. You know, yeah. I think maybe Bo Nix because he's a little older and he's been playing for so long. He has a lot of uh, experience, except his system that he played in is so simple. It'd be, you know, it'd be really uh, crucial for the offensive coordinator that we hire to be able to tailor an offense to a guy like that. So <laughs> there's a lot, you know, question marks, like you said, especially with the offensive coordinator being at play, you know, it really determines what kind of a route we're going to go down. Yeah. See, to me, Bo Nix is a project. And yeah, my totally, totally. is at his age and coming into the league and then the time you need to to have him learn what still is the Bill Walsh system dominant NFL, I would rather take someone younger. Yeah. You know, I'd rather go after Daniels or, or um, who was the other person I'm thinking of that I thought uh, – would do well. Whose mind is not in my mm, trying to, to 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 pull? Oh, Caleb. Oh yeah, Caleb Williams. Yeah, Caleb. Yeah, I think I'm more excited about Caleb than I am anybody else. Yeah, I'm gonna be really bummed if he goes to the Bears. <laughs> yeah, that would. He, here's the thing: if he goes to the Bears, then the Raiders should go after Justin Fields. And it, it's in, it, for the reasons that I believe apply. 
Well, I'm not going to say they applied it to Jameis Winston because I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that to Jameis. Jameis is a better passer than Justin Fields by by light years. Yeah. You know, and, and not just in terms of understanding what he's doing and everything else. So I'm not going to go that way. But I believe that Justin Fields is learning to a point where the Bears shouldn't give up on him. But if they're stupid enough to do so, rather than get Marvin Harrison and continue to build the offense, I'd snap him up in a second. Because that's, you know why? In labor economics, there's this term called, uh, there's, there's, there's general training and specific training. General training is when you, you take a job and you're learning to do like, oh, uh, typing something in, right? Mm-hmm. All right, that something that anybody else can do. But then there's specific training where somebody is saying, "Okay, well, I want you to write this computer program. And you know how to do this, and da, 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 all right? Or you know this particular offense, and it's nomenclature, and you know, da, da, da. Justin Fields has gotten to the point where he's gotten a lot of specific training, right? And now that somebody will say, "Hey, he can step in and play right now. I want that guy," and he's still not too old for me to have lost. He's at the prime where he's at, and they're going to give him up. Cool. Yeah, I mean, the the fans definitely want them. You know, with the crowd ca- uh, chanting, oh. we want Justin at the end of that last home game. It's so... Yeah. They love they love him in Chicago. I, I think oh. the idea of them getting rid of Luke Getze, bringing in Shane Waldron, um, and turning down Cliff Kingsbury kind of puts, puts in my mind that they're going to keep Justin because I thought that they were really going to get uh, yeah. Caleb Williams if they got Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. And I don't think Cliff is talking to any other teams besides the Bears and the Raiders. So, um, I mean, and the fact that we still have Champ Kelly as mm-hmm. assistant GM with his, you know, fantastic relationship with Ryan Poles, mm-hmm. I think we could very well work something out where we're we're going to be hurting, though. We're going to something's something. Someone is going to get traded that we don't want gone like and i'm worried it's going to be somebody like a nate hobbs or a trayvon merrig or it would be like a um man i'm trying to think i feel like it could be Devonte, kind of mm-hmm. if if the price was right but i don't i don't see Devonte being like yeah i'm gonna go to the bears yeah don't he wouldn't go to the bears i like, think just hang on that man's got too much gas in the tank I, I am not ready to part with him i'd rather build around him I, I would too, but I'm just trying to think like when you look at the charts of what it takes to trade up mm-hmm. and I mean the caliber of, we don't have that many caliber of players like that, that you'd be able to, you know, swap instead of a pick. Right. So it's, it would either have to be a plethora of players and picks. Um, I'm just, I'm really interested to see how we could make that work if we can, because it just really looks like we're, we're eyeing up to trade up for, Caleb Williams and get Cliff Kingsbury. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, what we got to pick this up later in the week. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted. I was going to say I, got, I do got to wrap it up here pretty soon. I just wanted to uh, finish off with some Super Bowl um, predictions here. Please do. Uh, just kind of we'll we'll start off with uh, the the NFC. So between the Niners and the Lions. This is a, a totally juicy matchup. San Francisco, really, it's Santa Clara. It's I, I grew up 15 minutes from where Levi Stadium's at, so oh. um, I actually performed at for the Super Bowl committee uh, for the 50th Super Bowl that was held at Levi's before before they decided it. And uh, my high school, we played. Wait, uh, wait, what? Oh, you were you were there at Super Bowl 50, or you were? Uh, but before Super Bowl 50 was decided to be in Santa Clara. Um, the Super Bowl committee came to Levi Stadium to survey the the location and all that, and have a meeting with uh, Santa Clara uh, city officials. Yeah. And and uh, my high school went out and we performed for the for the Super Bowl committee just to welcome them to uh, to Santa Clara. And huh. uh, I'm not going to say it was because of us, but they they signed and Super Bowl hey, 50 hey, was hey, indeed hey. held at Levi Stadium. But, uh, <laughs> I think the Niners are super desperate for another uh, for another ring, but I think there's another team that uh, is a little blue 
because they don't have a ring at all. And that's the Detroit Lions. I really, not only do I want to see Jared Goff just go in there and and totally just beat the brakes off the Niners in his in his hometown and go Bears. <laughs> but the uh, I I'd really love to just kind of see the uh, the underdog necessarily just kind of just kind of take it. Everyone's been saying that I was going to make it to the Super Bowl since the beginning of the season. And now the Detroit Lions have the opportunity to take that way. Dan Campbell is a firecracker of a coach. It looks like he's, you know, he looks like he's taking snaps every time he gets to his press conference because his face is beat red. and He's got marks all over his face like he was wearing a helmet. So I, I would love nothing more than to see Detroit Lions um, in the Super Bowl beating the beating the San Francisco 49ers. In the NFC Championship game, and then uh, the AFC is where it gets tricky. That's why I saved it for last. I think for me, um, when I was trying to bring the Super Bowl to Oakland, I went to my first NFL owners meeting, and the fall owners meeting at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare, fall of 1999, and it was. Uh, the me really probably shouldn't have been at because I probably should have been dead because I got an accident after a DUI. Oh man. Yeah. Fell asleep at the wheel. Had a little too much to drink. I was celebrating because I thought I had San Francisco's hotel rooms for our bid, which would have been like huge. Um uh, anyway, it didn't happen. I took my lunch dad to lunch. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. Um uh, and I um, gave my first presentation, but but I walked into my first party, which is a Wilson cocktail party, and Dr. York, Jed's dad. Wow, Jed York's dad? Yeah, Dr. York was there, uh, and I was giving my spiel about the NFL, that Oakland being the best place for the Super Bowl, and if, if NFL being America's Example of a shining city on a hill. And Nice de Bartolo York said, and I quote, Oh, you're so cute. I'll take you in my suitcase and bring you around the country with me. Then Dr. York said, What are you doing on the 20th of November? And I said, uh, I don't know. He said, Why don't you come to the 49ers game to our box? And that I did. And that's how I got the people like, Kevin O'Brien, who was the station manager at KTVU at the time, who came up to me and said, I will do a Super Bowl video for you. <laughs> I owe it all. I owe that to Dr. York. Wow. And I have, I have not went over since I've done press and just appropriately thanked him for that. Uh, and I talked to Jed quite a bit. And uh, I like them as people. And they really work hard to build their organization, show the Lions but it's in the 49ers house. And I, I do hope for all those people, including my friend Jerry Rice and everybody else, you know, that they win. Um, it would be nice. Uh, it would be nice. It would be nice for the Bay Area to have, yeah. a, you know, have an NFC champion, at least something to be happy about and all this stuff that we've been dealing with, right? Yeah. I mean, I would love it for my dad. He was a big Niners fan. He unfortunately passed away in December of 2020. But oh, sorry. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all right. And, uh, you know, I'd love it for him, but man, I know my, my dad loves underdog stories too. And my dad is a huge Jared Goff fan, loves Cal. So, uh, you know, I, he, he'd be torn. He'd be torn. He'd be happy for whoever won. I know that. It's me to the other part of it because, all right, because there is this nice, cool other part of this whole story. All right that I think your late father would appreciate, and therefore, by extension, I think you would appreciate uh, here. Uh, and um, goes all the way right to... Uh, there's a number. Where is it? Okay, I'll just do the... Uh, there we go. Right there. This is the best one of them. I'll just freeze that right here. And then I will stop that screen and go down here. 
allow, you can go back here, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, wow. And uh, see that? And then skip. This process to be over. I yeah, feel really glad. All right, Mike Silver's party. We were talking about you wearing the blue. You got the blue and good. the gold. You got the accent. Yep. You looking good, my man. Albert. Oh, yeah. Got yeah. all gal here. How's this night compared to what you expected so far? Uh, it's been a lot. It's been a lot of fun. It's more than I could really ever imagine, but uh, I've enjoyed it. And, uh, Really had a good time doing it. How fun is it to be representing University of California? It's awesome. It's awesome to be representing Cal and uh, get a chance to you know, put them on the map even more. It's, it's a good time. And how's your mom holding up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Go back. Go back. Go back. Have fun. Wow. Future Super Bowl champ right there. Go Bears. <laughs> Go Bears, baby. But uh yeah, and then just looking at the the AFC, man, I, I was I was telling uh some friends yesterday, I think there there's as much as I want Lamar Jackson of the Baltimore Ravens to knock out the Kansas City Chiefs and get to the you know face the Lions in the Super Bowl, uh financially and just from a business standpoint, I don't think there's any way, shape in hell that there is uh, that that's going to happen. I don't think the league is going to let that happen. I think the it, just oh, here, this is my the, here, here's the reason why. I'm listening. <laughs> if Taylor Swift doesn't go to the Super Bowl, if they don't get to show Taylor Swift on the Super Bowl, it, they're gonna they're missing out on viewers. They're missing out on money. They're think about all the little girls, all the little kids, uh, anyone who's a Swifty that is going to just watch that is going to just turn on the Super Bowl and have it playing in their house because Taylor Swift is going to come on the screen at some point. It is it, it would be well I mean we could be looking at historical numbers for Super Bowl views just because Taylor Swift is in attendance and that I mean frankly it pisses me off like I'm frustrated because I want to watch good football. So wait a minute, you're saying that they're going to actually throw the game for Taylor? I don't think the Ravens are going to voluntarily throw anything. I think the Ravens are going to try their damnedest to, to win this game. But I just have a feeling you're going to see every single call that could possibly be a call in the Chiefs' favor made. I mean, it's going to be Flag City. I think it's going to be Flag City. I think the fans, the fans should bring flags because there, there's just going to be Every time a flag gets thrown, I want everyone in the stands to throw another flag just to confuse the hell out of the refs, just so that they have to have a cleanup, just so they can think twice before they want to throw another flag. Now, you do not do know where this game is being played, right? I don't think it matters. I do. You know why? Those folks in Baltimore would come down out of the stands. You know, we ought to get, I ought to get Melissa on here. I'm glad it's in Baltimore. I would have, you know, uh, because, I mean, Baltimore is crazy. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was where the wire was filmed. Man, I just <laughs> you you know how the Chiefs are. You know how you know how the league loves Patrick Mahomes. And then here's the here's the second reason why I think it's gonna go that way. Travis Kelsey has been reported to retire at the end of his season, along with his brother Jason. And what better way to end his 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 great tenure with the Kansas City Chiefs and 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 his Hall of Fame career in the NFL, than to win a Super Bowl with Taylor Swift in attendance, and and propose to Taylor on national television in front of everybody, pretending you know using the Super Bowl ring to propose to her. Oh God, this is and, now you know I usually don't say this, but now I'm like barf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I. I was I was just trying to think I, I was trying to think of every way possible that uh, the script writers would 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 find a, a favor for the Kansas City Chiefs and I'm gonna say that that's it right there that's it right there you got you got Travis Kelsey retiring and Taylor Swift is in attendance and to marry them marry that idea to, together literally he's gonna propose to her at the very end I you know people have been you know just kind of joking or speculating about that and oh you know, should Taylor Swift get a ring too. If uh, if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, and uh, I don't think she deserves a Super Bowl ring of her own, but she can have one of her own, technically sharing it with Travis because she'll own half of his 
belongings. Okay, so here's the thing. The Ravens, the Browns, the Niners, the Jets, and the Cowboys had the best defenses in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. All right? Okay. Of them, the Browns are gone. Well, the Jets didn't make it to the playoffs. Jets, well, Jets, yeah, right. The Jets are gone, and the Cowboys had the best defense in the NFL, excuse me, is what I meant to say. But of those remaining standing, we have the Ravens. Okay? And best defense in the NFL. Yeah. And so my point is offense wins, sells tickets, defense wins championships. You know, you take defense all the time. So I, I would, the, the Chiefs, the defense is like mid, mid range, mid. Uh, dude, it's, it's one and two. It's Ravens, Chiefs right there. I mean, go look at I mean, uh, Fox Sports, PFF, okay. uh, ESPN, CBS. All right. It, it's, it's one and two. The playoffs are just total defense league season. Big difference. That is, I want to say that's the yeah, but now. the league. I think, I don't know. I, the last one I looked at was Fox Sports. That was, that was the most recent one. It was like January 17th it was posted. Okay, let me see something here. Uh, how come uh, I won't get this? Maybe ESPN has a pretty good tracker. Oh. I'll just come up there. All right. 2023 NFL defensive rankings, ESPN, StatMuse. Bears number one, Cardinals are number two. Wait a minute. This must be in reverse order. Uh, let me try this again because that's that doesn't look right. Uh, all right. They have they have this ad that will not go away. All right, now it went away. Then I scroll down. Okay, so what do we have here? Um. Oh, and they asked me to pay for that. Forget it. Uh, let's see here. NFL offense, defense, stat leaders. There. Here we go. Yeah, that's postseason. Here we go. Ravens one, Niners two. That's postseason. I'm looking for. Okay. Well, we have. Yeah, that's postseason. I'll go with both. Let's go with both. You you read that one. And I'll read the other one. Yeah, Ravens one, uh, see, Niners two, Rams three, Ravens one. four, Chiefs are at six. They had Eagles at five. See, okay, I don't need to. Do, I, case closed. <laughs> There's your game right there, man. That's it, <laughs> man. I I'm telling you, I'm I think Lamar and the Ravens are a better team. I think John Harbaugh's coaching his freaking socks off this year. I think Andy Reid's slipping. Um, the the only the only thing. Trent McDuffie, George Karloftis, Justin Reed, and uh, uh, Sneed. Sneed. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there, those are some tough guys, you know. And then put so you know, George Karloftis and Chris, Chris Jones in the front, and Justin Reed and uh, Legarius Sneed in the back with Trent McDuffie. Uh, it's, it's not a bad secondary. Out of the teams left. It's it's Ravens Chiefs mm-hmm. right now. So, but I, 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 just I, I, because the Ravens are the better team doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to win. And I bet you the NFL is looking at that Taylor Swift money like, man, we might need her. We might need her at the game. She ain't gonna be there if Travis ain't playing. The Super Bowl makes money. Period. So I, I think that once it's done, the 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 Taylor Swift. Gaga will be partially replaced, not entirely, by those who want to see Lamar get a ring. Yeah, and because that would be the ultimate end to all this black quarterback stuff. You realize that, right? And and that's what I'm saying. I would I would love nothing more than for Lamar to go in there and win it. You know, because to me, Patrick Mahomes winning it, I never feel like it's a convincing victory. I don't feel like he's earned it every time. Mm-hmm. So Lamar's earned it. Lamar's, you know, grinded, you know, battled through real injuries and, and, and made a real comeback. He's the ultimate underdog. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Zenny, I think that's our, our prediction here. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it better be, we'll leave it at this. It better be Ravens Lions in the Super Bowl. 
<sighs> but if it's Ray, if it's Ravens Niners, yeah, because if I think as much as I wouldn't mind the Niners being there, I will say this: if it's Ravens Niners again, the Ravens are just going to manhandle them again. Oh yeah, there's I mean, especially that, the way that the Niners played Green Bay. You think that they're gonna right. come out, come out and do that again? Especially if they don't have Debo Samuel. And that's the other situation going into this game with the Lions, right? I mean, look, if the 49ers are a team of destiny, we'll find out this mm-hmm. weekend. Yep. Because my thought is my 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 feeling is that they're gonna get outplayed. Mm-hmm. And. I, I told this to my buddies um, for the last game. The the Texans Ravens game came down to coaching. It came down to D'Amico Rice D'Amico Ryan's versus John Harbaugh. Sorry, D'Amico, you're a rookie. John Harbaugh's been to the Super Bowl. He's won a Super Bowl. He's been what to two, one one. Opinion that put him in that area. I'm sorry. What did he do that put him over? In other words, coaching wise, what is it that? What caused you to say he was out coached? Um, the the positions that he put that D'Amico put CJ in, I felt like um, weren't weren't conducive to him actually having success. I felt like he was so worried about um, CJ Stroud having success, like mm-hmm. every play mm-hmm. that they they strayed away from things that were working. Like, I mean, I know their running game was shoddy. But they, regardless of how shoddy it is, you got to give the running back those touches and you got, you got to go through those handoffs so you can set things up later. And I just felt like they were trying to play catch up before they even got behind. And then they got behind and couldn't play catch up. And that's coaching. Here's where I agree with you. And then I don't, I think it's not so much a matter of, the Texas being out coached as their running game being inappropriately designed to start with, regardless of who they played. They have a tendency, for example, to use weak side runs in a way that classically you don't do. And if you look at the the effective NFL running games of the 60s and the 70s. Mm-hmm. You know, dominated by the Packers, the Cowboys, and the AFC, the Raiders, and the Chiefs, and so on, right? They all had one thing in common. Even if it was weak side, they got a hat on a hat. They If they left someone unblocked, it was the safety, because the safety was way up on high, right? Yeah. And then they could the wide receiver get the safety. Today, you will see weak side runs where there's no, there's no, there's no, Okay, maybe the tight end is over here, okay? But you only have one back in the backfield. You have no blocking back to the weak side. To pick well, up- yeah, lead blocking is lead blocking's a, a dead art, essentially. I've only really seen two teams consistently use lead blocking all year, and well, that is the Dolphins and, uh, and the Eagles. And that's what gets me about the Texans. So Kyle Van Noy comes in. Downs the running back for a loss, switches off with the defensive end, and guess what? There's no halfback or fullback to come in and you know seal off the edge so that the runner has a chance to get around the edge. So what happens? The runner gets down for a loss because you've got the tackle, instead of the tackle mining his business with the end, the tackle's coming inside, trying to do the work of the guard who's getting beat. And they're all trying to catch the end because the end slanted in sl- side. Yeah. You have the extra blocker over there. You know, you can pick up that guy slanting inside, push him out of the way, and know that if your running back is going to go to the outside, you got the, the lead back taking care of Van Noy. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't happening. So what happens is that they get. Van Noy comes in, he gets his pressure, the running back stops, he goes back into the tackle who stops him for a loss. Yep. And that was one play. There are a bunch of plays that were like that way, and the Texans had this annoying tendency to use the same basic single back formation all the time. Yeah. You, you're yeah. talking about like third and one, fourth and one. You got the guy way back there, five and six yards in the backfield. There's there was no creativity to the no. run game. Not at all. Not at all. 
And, and, and so to me, that's why they lost. So you would say, yeah, give it to him. I'm like, out of, out of those sucky plays, no way, dude. You know, no way. Uh-uh. That's what I was getting at. And, and yeah, I understand. It's like, and when I said give him more touches, like it needs to be, he needs more touches in a different design. Yeah. You, you got you to freshen it, freshen it up. Like not, not just keep running the same play over and over again if it's not working. But. You'll get a hat on every single body. It's coaching one-on-one, hat on a hat. Yeah, that, that's all. Uh, anyway. And, and so that, that's just kind of why I came back to, you know, John Harbaugh knew knew what to do. He knew how to force them in it. He basically oh. knew how to make them one-dimensional, and that's what that's what he did. And you're absolutely right about that. So that's uh that that's how it is. And and we're we're about two hours deep in this thing. And, and we can uh, go over, man. It's great, it's great. Hey, great combos, Any Love absolutely. always love chatting with you, man. Yeah. And uh yeah, let's get let's get Warren Moon or somebody out on here. I'm on it. I'm on, brother. Right. Hey, stick around in the background. Yeah, absolutely. Folks, please subscribe to Zenny62 on YouTube. Yep, check check out. me out on uh, at the uh, Highlight Hendo Network down yeah. here. Right yeah. here, Highlight Hendo. I'm also on uh, Twitter and YouTube. Check me out. There you go. All right. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, Absolutely. by the way, we're going to have a little set of different conversations in the future by some people requested, you know, hey, talk about different things. But, uh, okay. Uh, but I want to talk about some football for more. So we'll see. <laughs> We'll talk about non-football stuff after the Super Bowl. We'll talk about related subjects like, uh, well, since I was called sexist, maybe I should talk about uh, the greatest legs in the Australian Open. I don't know. <laughs> and since we're talking about Cal, we can talk about the uh, the California State University strike that was uh, it was, was planned for a week, ended in a day off of a tentative agreement for teachers to get a raise. So I like that one. Cool. All yeah, right. yeah, good stuff. Hey, stick around in the background, folks. Okay, folks, we'll see you. All right. Oh, and by the way, just because I might be sexist, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> sexist, but I am a horn dog. All right, anyway. <laughs> see that person out there, you know who you are. I think you know. I got your number. All right. Because I'm 62 and you're not. <laughs> oh, I'll be 62. All right.